Aloha, my dear siblings in Christ. Now I'm recording this message for you on March 24th, 2022. The Thursday after the third Sunday in Lent. Now I apologize for not having this message, this conversation about the book of Job for you yesterday. As you know, I usually send something out on Wednesdays. But I only returned late Tuesday evening from uh, being in Texas at a House of Bishops meeting. I was there for over a week. And there just wasn't the right place to continue this conversation for me to record something. So I held off until I returned to be with you back home, here on the islands. Now, you'll remember we're continuing a conversation about the book of Job and the nature of suffering. Now, we're preparing to lift mass mandates and things seem to be opening up so that the COVID reality, the pandemic, is changing. It's still here, but the intensity of a year ago is, is abating. But the news is filled with horrific images from Ukraine. We still have issues of racial justice to contend with in our own nation these islands, and justice for LBGTQ people in the church and in the world. So we still have questions of suffering. Why? Now you remember we're continuing our conversation about Job. Job is sitting on the dung heap, he has sores on his body, and his three friends have joined him. And they are his friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. So I want you to look this week at two large sections of the book of Job. Chapters 15 to 21, and then chapters 22 to 30. These sections actually you will find maybe a little boring because it seems that Job and his friends are rehashing the same thing over and over and over again. His friends hold to that deep-seated contention that people suffer because they have sinned. Now let's think for a moment though why they might think that way. If you believe that God is a God of justice and you believe with all your heart, with all your mind that God is El Shaddai, God the Almighty, how can the Almighty God of justice allow good things to happen to bad people and bad things to happen to good people? So God is either El Shaddai, the Almighty, and allows bad things to happen to good people, that would make God unjust. And if God is unjust, then surely that is not the God of Israel. You see the dilemma. You and I know, because we heard from the first two chapters that this is about something well beyond humanity. But Job and his three friends don't know the backstory. Now, if you read Job, you have to read it as a drama, as a great story. So in chapter 15, we hear from 
from Elphaz. And you begin to say that the wicked will fall down. Let me list a little bit of chapter 15. Listen to me and I will argue with you. What I have seen I will declare to you. What the wise have told me has not been concealed from their family. To whom alone the earth was given. No stranger passed in their midst. All the days of the wicked are painful. The number of years reserved for the hateful. It's a, it's a clear statement. Now, now, Job keeps saying, you are sorry comforters. How can you just keep beating me up like this? God delivers me to a criminal and forces me into the hand of the wicked. I was at rest, but he, God, shattered me, seized me by the neck and dashed me to pieces. Job repeatedly just says, I, I do believe in God. I am faithful to God. If you're right, I want to argue my case before God. I, I want to know if God's, God Almighty's judgments are no doubt inscrutable, but just and right. I'm innocent. Why am I suffering like this? So, so, as you can see, to his friends, Job's suffering implies guilt. The, the, you know, there's a consequence. Now, now, you have to understand the logic of his friends. I, my, my Job, if you would just repent, just beg God for forgiveness. God is righteous and true. God will forgive you. All will be okay again. But you see, that's not the experience of human life, is it? Now, Job, in probably the most famous passage, chapter 19, in the book of Job, it's actually used in Handel's Messiah and in Brahms' Requiem. It, 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 it strikes at the heart of what will become a Christian use of Job. It's even a lesson in the burial rite of the Episcopal Church. Do you remember it? Chapter 19, verse 25. But I know that my Redeemer is alive, and afterward he will rise upon the, I, he'll rise upon the dust. After my skin has been torn apart this way, then my flesh, I'll see God, whom I'll see myself, my eyes see, and not as a stranger. I am utterly dejected. I know my Redeemer lives. And I shall see God. Now, I think this passage is more about how Job is seeking the divine trial. He's saying, God, if, if, if I've done something wrong, set me before the bar. And in this case, I don't think the Redeemer he's looking for is God. God's the judge. I think he's probably just as the adversary, remember from chapter one and or two, the adversary is part of the heavenly host, the angelic horde, or maybe the demigods of this very, very old story. I think that Job is calling for an angelic lawyer who will argue his case before God. Now you can see how for those of us who are the followers of Christ Jesus as the incarnate Lord, ah, this passage means we've had such an advocate. 
but that's reading back into an ancient text. What's here is Job is still struggling. How? How? That traditional belief. And as you can tell, I'm not sure Job disbelieves it. But, but, but how? God, show me what I've done. Why am I suffering so? In chapter 21, listen carefully to my remarks and let that comfort you. Bear with me so that I can speak, I myself, and after my reply you can mock. Are my complaints against another human? Why is my patience short? Turn to me and be appalled. Lay your hand over my mouth. If I recall it, I am scared, shaking and seizing my body. God, listen. Why are you doing this to me? So then if you look at chapters 22 to 30, it, it's more of a repeat of the same thing. His friends, becoming more and more frustrated, keep trying to press Job. Uh, maybe you missed something. Uh, maybe you left something undone. Now, now, Job, don't do this to God. His friend, Bildad, is actually even gets mad at him. Job, you know, well, why are you being so negative? Are you trying to hide some guilt? Don't be fatalist. Uh, by fatalism, meaning that, that life's just terrible and then you die. Job's not a fatalist. Job is actually struggling with God. See, he's moving beyond self-pity in, in, uh, in the ongoing conversation. Job, in his pain, is trying to look into the inscrutable. What is the mind of God? So his friends keep recounting uh, what's happened. Now, if you look at uh, chapter 20, his friend Zophar actually goes through and tries to refute line by line everything that Job has said. But it all gets back to the nature of God. It, it, it's the notion of where is God in human pain. For his three, three friends, it's easy. God is in the human pain and the consequences of our very actions. But for Job, this doesn't work. For Job, the problem becomes, ah, I'm not that person. Who am I? If you turn, though, and I think the most important part of this section, chapter 28. Now, is chapter 28 really the voice of anyone? These, it does get a little hard in here, and if you can read it as sarcasm, it helps in, in chapter 26, 27, if you're trying to understand what this means. But if you look at chapter 28, I think that this is a beautiful statement of wisdom literature. You see, that's what we've been talking about is wisdom literature. How do you understand as a human being the presence of God? What makes one righteous? How does one deal with suffering? So 
even if you don't read any other part of the, the, of the Job, if you don't get through chapter 15 to 21 or chapter 22 to 30, read chapter 28. In it, maybe this chapter 28, remember his friends have been harping at him. There's some confusion in the text. You're kind of just saying the same thing over again. If I were staging Job, you know, as a play with his three friends around, I think I would have the lighting change so that his friends weren't seen. And the light would come down on Job and this would be what was going on in Job's mind. There is a sure source of silver, a place where gold is refined. Iron is taken from the earth, rock is melted into copper. Humans put an end to darkness, dig for ore in the farthest depths, into stone in utter darkness. Often a shaft away from any inhabitant, places forgotten by those on foot. Apart from any human, they hang and sway. Earth, from it comes food, is turned over below ground as by fire. The rocks are the source of Lapis and Azuli, where gold dust is in it. A path, no bird of prey knows it. A hawk's eyes hasn't seen it. Proud beasts haven't trodden on it. A lion hasn't crossed over it. Humans thrust their hands into flint, pull up mountains from their roots, cut channels into rocks. Their eyes see everything precious. They dam up the sources of rivers. Hidden things come to light. Now, now, in this little section, perhaps the mind of Job, think about everything that humans do, the work, the amazing things. But then the shift. If humans can find gold, if humans can, can harvest food, if humans can turn the tide of rivers. But wisdom, where can it be found? Where is the place of understanding? Humankind doesn't know its value. It isn't found in the land of the living. The deep says, it is not with me, and the sea says, uh, not alongside me. It can't be bought with gold. Its price can't be measured in silver. Can't be weighed against the gold from Ophir, or the precious onyx or lapis lazuli. Neither gold nor glass can compare to it. She can't be acquired with gold jewelry. Coral and jasper shouldn't be mentioned. The price of, of, of wisdom is more than rubies. Cushite topaz won't compare with her. She can't be set alongside pure gold. But wisdom, wisdom, where does she come from? Where is the place of understanding? She is hidden from the eyes of all the living, concealed from the birds. Destruction and death have said to her, we've heard a report of you. But God understands her way. He knows her place. He looks to the ends of the earth and surveys everything beneath the heavens in order to weigh the wind to prepare the measure of the seas when he made a decree for the rain, a path, a path for thunderbolts. Then he observed it. He spoke it, established it, searched for it, and said to humankind, Look, the fear of the Lord is wisdom. Turning from evil is understanding. See, the shift here is a move from a legal understanding, a balance understanding, a hint of the holy, the inscrutability of God personified in true wisdom.
There, there's not a transactional relationship between humanity and the divine. But human beings can seek to some understanding in the wisdom that comes from God. We're actually beginning to see a shift, which we will see in the, in the end of the book, moving God from a player. And isn't that what God is in Job, a player? Yes, the divine judge, but also the divine manipulator. To being the cosmic God. So we're beginning to see a shift as you look through these words. Now Job and his friends are worn down. They have been constantly, constantly arguing. His friends said, well, you blew it. There's something you might have done or left undone. Maybe you didn't take care of the poor. Maybe you, you hurt even your, your, your manservant or your maidservant. Maybe, maybe you, you, you forgot what you did. And Job returns again and again. Maybe that's true. But I need God to show me. I don't think that's true. I still trust in God. And Job still would like his day in divine court. But here in chapter 29, uh, the author, the editor, slips in this poem about wisdom, slips in this notion, there may be something bigger, something larger that we don't understand. As we human beings have control of a great deal, but if God is El Shaddai, God the Almighty, there will be much that we do not understand. So again, if you can, please read chapters 15 to 21 and then the next section, 22 to 30. But pay special attention to chapter 29 of Job. What for you is the nature of suffering? Where is God in suffering? Do you maybe believe that bad things happen to good people just a little bit because they deserve it? Ah, the addict. They just don't have a strong enough will. What's wisdom? Next week, we'll talk about a fourth interlocutor that's joined the conversation. But until then, Let us pray. O oh God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all of those who have gone astray from your ways. Bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast face to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word, Jesus Christ, your Son who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God forever and ever. Amen. My dear siblings in Christ, know you how your Redeemer lives. And it is Christ. Christ Jesus, our Lord. And by the death and resurrection of Christ, you and I know that God loves us. And that as your bishop, 
I love you, and I pray for you every day. Please pray for me. Aloha.